Today, we're uh, going to spend Lecture A talking about Section 8.2 mostly, although I am going to redo that more difficult type of problem that we did last lecture uh, in Chapter 6 about the power and trying to get a, a significantly high power. Do that uh, problem that you turned in for today, Part A of it. If you did Parts B and C, great. Um, I actually didn't mean to assign parts B and C. I didn't notice that they were related to something we didn't talk about. It was a tough thing to do. Part A was tough enough as it was. Parts B and C, if you were able to try to do it, great. The graders will not grade parts B and C. Uh, and you will just grade part A, and we will go over that here in a few minutes. Second part of the lecture, part B is going to focus just on the review of the test next Tuesday. And actually, we will start the test at 10.45 rather than 10.50. That's what we did for the first test. I didn't realize that. I didn't remember that. So you will have, uh, looks like an hour and 40 minutes for that, 100 minute test. So hopefully you can finish in 75 or 80 minutes. But if you need a little bit more time, you can have that extra time. It is cumulative. As I mentioned, though it is a heavier emphasis on chapters 5, 6, 7, and 8. If you haven't started studying, start now, start today. Especially if you haven't started studying yet, I would recommend studying at least an hour every day from now until next Tuesday, maybe even an hour and a half. And as I always try to emphasize, you want to practice old exams. Um, and in fact, to give you more possibilities to practice, I will post two other exams up on Moodle <clears throat> that I haven't posted yet, maybe even three. Uh, let's go ahead and take a look at what's on Moodle right now. So what can you see on Moodle right now? Look under old exams. There's an exam one from fall 2012 with some answers, two selected problems. Mostly these are answers to the non-multiple choice problems. There's an exam two from fall 2013. And there's an exam three from fall 2013. There's something relevant on each of these old exams. And uh, yes, I think I will put three more old exams up, exams one, two, and three from other years. Um, remember the exam is cumulative. You should probably focus on old exams two and three from past falls first. That will be more relevant as far as what's weighted heavier, chapters five, six, seven, and eight. So when you look at old exams two and three, when I've taught this in previous semesters, I've had three exams during the main part of the semester before the final. The first exam on these old exams went through the beginning of chapter 4. The second exams on these old exams went from that beginning of chapter 4 through actually um, the end of chapter 6. And the third exam went through the end of chapter 6 through actually the beginning of chapter 10. And again, I typically skip chapter 9, at least with recent years. In future years, I, you might have to do chapter 9. So when you look at exams two and three on these old exams, you'll notice here it says covering sections 4.3 through 6.3. All of that pretty much is relevant for this exam, although the heavier emphasis starts with chapter five. Okay? So it's all relevant really with exam two. Though again, the heavier emphasis starting with chapter five problems. As far as exam three goes, covering these sections, skipping chapter 9, for you guys, all of that is relevant except for section 10.1, except for chapter 10, which is going back to regression, although it's in more depth than we did in chapter 2. You still need to know the chapter 2 stuff about regression for this test to a certain degree. I will try to highlight things that are more likely to be on the exam. I haven't written the exam yet. I'll try to highlight things that are going to be more likely to be on the exam from chapters 1, 2, 3, and 4 
so you don't necessarily need to know everything. If I end up writing, after writing the exam, putting something that I don't emphasize today, I will let you know. Okay? But again, exam three, everything's relevant except for the chapter 10 problems. Chapter with exam one, basically everything's relevant at the moment, though again, I'll try to highlight certain things that are more, <coughs> like, more likely to be on the exam than others. Okay? So again, I will put three more exams up this afternoon, and I'll start working on answers to those questions too. But you should time yourself when you take these old exams, especially exams two and three, say. You should time yourself. Maybe give yourself less time. Instead of an hour and 40 minutes, give yourself just an hour and 10 minutes or something. Try to do it without a note card. You probably want to study before you, you do it. Review things at least for, say, a half hour. Try to do it without a note card. Got your calculator. See how you do, okay? Time yourself. You start to feel the anxiety. That gives you feedback about how prepared you are and where you're stronger and where you're weaker. Maybe do it at the same time as another person. Check your answers with what I have. Compare with each other. Talk about problems that both gave you trouble. Discuss the multiple choice questions. Try to come to a consensus about those. And then maybe a day or two later, try to do it again. Okay? We've got five days left here before the test. Doing that type of thing is the kind of serious work you need to put in if you're going to do well. Because it is a harder exam. <coughs> Don't make your note card until probably next Monday night or something. And then you're, you're put, you can use both sides. Then you're putting only the things that you feel the shakiest about on the note card. And you'll know better what to put on the note card. And you're not going to try to, don't try to make your note card too dense. <coughs> you're putting the things you feel weakest on, it's there for your security to reduce your anxiety. But then go into the exam saying, I'm going to try to do the exam without the note card. People who spend their time searching through the note card don't do well, as a general rule. Do you have any questions or thoughts that you want to share or ask? Okay. I do want you to be able to do well, but it's going to take work to get there. Okay. I believe you can do well if you put in more. I believe everybody can do better than they have done, maybe, on homework, say. I believe everybody, when you put in enough work, you can do that. Go to Math Lab, ask them questions, too. Again, 3x5 note card, both sides is fine. You can put anything you want in the note card, but again, suggestion, don't make it too dense. And focus on the things you're weakest on. You will need your calculator, unlike the quizzes. You'll be doing calculations, or you'll need your calculator. Make sure you can calculate mean, standard deviations, regression points, that kind of thing. As far as the, the Z tests and T tests, you can use your calculator to calculate P values, for example, but you don't have to. If you do use your calculator to calculate P value, make sure you write it on there that you did it that way. It's a more precise P value. But you're only required to be able to use the tables. And so with t-tests, with p-values there, you don't have to give real good approximations to p-values. You only have to give ranges of values. But those are always good enough to either reject them all or not, based on certain outputs. But it's tricky. This, this table is tricky, right? So practice it if you're out of practice, especially the p-value calculation. Make sure your batteries are fresh. All right, let's do start by doing that example that was on the homework. That was like the problem we did last time, where you're trying to figure out the sample size necessary to get a certain power. In this case, the power was 0.9 instead of 0.8. Problem 6.103. The situation is this. You're testing a null hypothesis that mu is 0 versus an alternative that mu is greater than zero. 
This is a chapter six problem. You're told what the population standard deviation is, which is not realistic, but for the sake of keeping things as simple as possible, we go ahead and pretend we know that. Sigma is two. Alpha is five percent on this problem. 0 0.05. The picture here is going to involve two normal curves to help you think this through. This is going to be the sampling distribution of x bar. And by the way, if I ask you to draw accurate pictures for situations, you should be able to do that too. And I think it's a good idea, even if I don't ask you, to help you think it through. Sampling distribution of x bar, if we assume mu is zero if we assume the null is true, which is what you always assume when you're actually doing the test, when you're calculating the p-value. So this is going to be centered on zero in that case, because that's the null value, mu is zero. The standard deviation of the sampling distribution, that's sigma sub x bar, that's sigma over square root of n. We're told sigma is two. We're not told n yet. That's what we want to find is n. There's some critical value labeled x crit for this right-tailed test that's going to be the boundary of the rejection region. If the sample mean is to the right of x crit, then you're going to reject the null. Since alpha is 0 0.05, that, the critical value is chosen in such a way to make this area equal to alpha equal to 0 0.05. This area equals alpha equals 0 0.05. You might remember from last time that the z critical value for a right tail test when alpha is 0 0.05 was 1.645. Let's confirm that. Table again gives you areas to the left of numbers, to the left of z values. So if we want the area to the right of a z value to be 0 0.05, we're looking for an area to the left of 0.95, 1 minus 0 0.05. Again, it's good to have your book with so you can see better, since it's hard to see this. But those two numbers, 0.9495 and 0.9505, are equally close to 0.95. They correspond to 1.64 and 1.65. Average those, get 1.645. That's the corresponding z critical value. Let's not worry about that at the moment, though. We ultimately want to find the x critical value. The, um, when you look at the book's example, they say the alternative value that you're thinking about for the power calculation is mu equals 1. So over here somewhere is mu equals 1, and the sampling distribution when mu is 1 would be centered on 1. That's an alternative value for the right tail test that you're going to be thinking about the power for. This is the sampling distribution of x bar. If mu is 1. We want to choose n in such a way, the point of the problem is to choose n in such a way that this area, which represents the power, is 0.9. You want this area to be 0.9. You don't know what n is yet that will make that happen. That's what you want to solve for. You want that area to be 0.9. Let's write this in terms of probability notation, these two things you want to have happen. You want the probability of a type 1 error to be 0 0.05. What is a type 1 error? That's when you reject the null when you should not have, because it's true. When x bar is to the right of the critical value, whatever that is, I don't know what the critical value is. It's not the same as what their example is, because they picked n equals 25. We don't know what n is yet. We want... Whatever this critical value is, when we assume the null is true, we want to be in that rejection region with probability 0 0.05 when the null is true. That's because
because alpha is 0 0.05. We want that to be the probability of type 1 error. And that's, that is the probability of a type 1 error, because you're in the rejection region when the mill is true. And you use 0. We also want the power to be 0 0.9. What's the power again? What's the probability of correctly rejecting the mill when it's false? The alternative is true. What alternative value are we thinking about? We're assuming mu is 1. So this is the probability that x bar is bigger than x crit if mu is 1. We want that to be 0.9. Okay, you got clarity of thought about what we want to have happen? Now you want to convert this to what it would mean in terms of z, based on these two different assumptions. Sorry that I'm going backwards across the board here. When you convert to z, in the first case, by taking x crit minus 0 over sigma sub x bar, You want that to be 0 0.05. That means this number here has to be the 1.645. You set that equal to 1.645, which is going to give you one equation in these two unknowns, x crit and sigma sub x bar. This is just like the example we did last time. You're trying to convert to z to help you find x crit and sigma sub x bar especially sigma sub x bar, so you can find n. That's the goal, is to find n. What would the other one say in terms of z? There you're subtracting 1, because you're assuming mu is 1. You want that to be 0.9. Go back to the table. You want the area to the right of some z value to be 0 0.9, meaning the area to the left is 0 0.1. What number is closest to 0 0.1? It's right there, 0 0.1003. Corresponds to a z critical value of negative 1.28. So that means this number right there needs to be negative 1.28. So now you've got a system of algebra equations to solve. Can you go on this board here if you can turn the camera? X crit divided by sigma sub x bar must equal 1.645. Subtract 0, means you don't need to write it there. And X crit minus 1 over sigma sub x bar must equal negative 1.28. You can solve this system of equations for these two unknowns. In fact, you really only need to solve for sigma sub x bar so we can find n. This means x crit after multiplying both sides by sigma sub x bar is 1.645 times sigma sub x bar. And this equation means if you multiply both sides by one, sigma sub x bar and then add 1 to both sides, then x crit is also 1 minus 1.28 times sigma sub x bar. These are both equal to x crit, so they're equal to each other. So you get 1.645 times sigma sub x bar equals 1 minus 1.28 times sigma sub x bar. Try to isolate the six, sigma sub x bar on the left side by adding it to both sides. If you do that, it cancels on that side. On this side, you get 2.9, uh, what, 9.25 sigma sub x bar, is that right? On this side, you're left with a 1. Now divide both sides by 2.925. Sigma sub x bar, which equals sigma over square root of n, which is 2 over square root of n, must equal 1 divided by 2.925, which is 0.34188. I'll go 
go ahead and carry more decimal places. 0, 3, 4, 1, 9. I'll just round at the end. Being a little paranoid, I probably don't have to go that far. Set these two things equal to each other now and solve for n. We're almost done. You can rewrite the equation by multiplying both sides by square root of n and dividing both sides by 0 0.341, etc. What do you get? Square root of n is 2 over 0 0.341880341. That's approximately ah, 2 divided by 0 0.341880319 is about, well, it's, it comes up to 5.85. Now square both sides. You get n is 34.2225, which you should round up to 35. That's the answer. That should have been the answer you got. I hope you did your very best to try to get that. I'm not sure if the math lab people were, were able to help you. This is kind of a hard problem that maybe they couldn't do. Tell you what, I haven't given you guys much extra credit in this class as much as I do in some of my other classes. We'll make this extra credit as a little treat. So if you were able to get it, you'll get, let's say, five extra credit points toward your overall homework score. If you're able to get some of it, but not all of it, you can get some partial credit as extra credit. OK, just for part A of this problem. Again, could this be on the test? Possibly. I haven't written the test yet. But again, if I do put it on the test, I'll probably give you some help. Though it's still going to be difficult because it's still sort of a hard problem to describe and part of the difficulty people have is just in reading the problem and trying to decode what they're supposed to do. So that's another reason to practice, is decoding problems and understanding what the problem is about, decoding what you're supposed to do. That's another thing that gives people difficulty. Big difficulty. All right. Uh, let's do a section 8.2 problem. Comparing two population proportions. For section 8.2, big picture is you've got two populations and two population proportions that you'd like to compare. Just like in chapter 7, we compared two population means. And once again, it's the same song and dance. We could do confidence intervals, or we can do hypothesis testing. The hypothesis testing in this section, 8.2, is a little extra tricky. And I think for the sake of time, we're only going to do the confidence interval today, and that's all you're responsible for from section 8.2 in the test. So on those old tests, if you see a compared to proportions problems, that's a hypothesis test, you can skip that part. But we will do the confidence in the part. Okay? Which is a little easier. <clears throat> a major court case on the liability for contamination of groundwater took place in the town of, that's not Woburn, it's Woburn. <coughs> How do I know? <coughs> I went to Boston one time. And I got in a taxi to have the taxi driver take me to this town. That's where my hotel was. And I said, can you please take me to Woburn? And he said, Woburn? Where is that? Woburn. It's Woburn. OK. So it's Woburn. All right, I can't do a Boston accent, though. But he said it's Woburn. So he took me to Woburn, Massachusetts. It's, a it's close to Boston. A town well in Woburn was contaminated by industrial chemicals. I gotta tell you another story about that cab driver sometime too. Maybe, maybe next Thursday after the test, because it's, really, it's pretty funny. Same cab driver. A town well in Woburn was contaminated during the period where wet residents drank water from this well. There were 16 birth defects among 414 births. In years where the well was shut off and the water was supplied from other wells, there were three birth defects in 228 births. This is out of the book. I'm assuming this actually happened. The plaintiffs suing the firms responsible for the contamination claim that these data show the rate of birth defects was higher when the contaminated well was in use. Actually, this is the way this problem is phrased makes it sound like we should do a hypothesis test, but we'll focus on 
just doing that confidence interval. What is it a confidence interval for? It's for estimating the difference in the population proportions. It's a little funny here because in reality you would think the proportions that they're talking about here would be in a sense population proportions because these are all the babies that are born during these times. So it, it seems to me like maybe this is not such a great situation to really apply statistical inference. It's more of a descriptive statistics thing and this is actually what happened for the populations. But for the sake of doing statistical inference, we'll imagine that maybe these are not all the babies that were born. Maybe there were some other babies that they lost track of. Maybe you could even consider the population to be babies that weren't born but could have been born. I don't know. We're going to do statistical inference here. But it's a little bit sketchy whether that really is a good idea or not. We're going to find a confidence interval to estimate the, two, the difference in the two population proportions. And I'm calling the population proportions, I'm essentially defining them here, which you should be able to do on the test if I ask you to, to define the population parameters to be means or proportions. The first proportion is the fraction of all birth defects that could have occurred from all women drinking the contaminated water. <coughs> could have occurred, but maybe didn't occur because they didn't actually have a baby. Okay, humor me here. And the other population proportion is going to be the fraction of all birth defects that could have occurred from women drinking the uncontaminated water. Fraction is synonymous with proportion. I could have used proportion here. This thing up to uh, this point, that is going to be P1. <coughs> and the fraction for the other one, that's going to be P2. Sorry if this is a little bit strange to see here. Kind of circle these here. Uh, probably should have used different colors. This fraction is the P2. Contaminated versus uncontaminated water. We want to know how close in value are P1 and P2. A nice way to do that is to estimate the difference. P1 minus P2 with a confidence interval. Almost quit the time. We'll go, let's go a little further. Yeah, a few more minutes. What's the natural point estimate? How about P1 hat minus P2 hat? Difference of the sample proportion which we can calculate based on these numbers. 16 out of 414 and 3 out of 228. Calculate those fractions, you calculate the sample proportions. Plus or minus a margin of error. What's the margin of error? Well, remember in chapter 8, it's nice. You don't have to use T. We use Z again. Special number Z star times a standard error. The standard error is always the standard error for whatever the point statistic is, for whatever the point estimator is. First, in the first examples, it was standard error for x bar when we were estimating mu. Back in chapter 7. The second example in chapter 7, it was a standard error for x1 bar minus x2 bar when we were trying to estimate mu1 minus mu2. In chapter 8, at the beginning of the first section, it was Standard error for p hat when we were trying to estimate p. Here we're trying to estimate the difference, p1 minus p2. So it's a standard error for this statistic, p1 hat minus p2 hat. But that again begs a question, what's the formula for that? Well, based on similar reasoning, that I hinted at, oh, was it a couple class periods ago? Where I was doing the standard error for x1 bar minus x2 bar, and I talked about variances and standard deviations of differences of random variables under the assumption that the samples are independent of each other. Using some formulas back from chapter 4, actually. 
We saw in chapter 7 there was a square root and there was like an S1 squared over N1 plus S2 squared over N2. It's a similar kind of overall big picture idea that can allow you to derive this formula for the standard error. It's a square root again. Not of S1 squared over N1 plus S2 squared over N2. This is not a mean and standard deviation problem. It's a proportion problem. It's P1 hat times 1 minus P1 hat over N1 plus P2 hat times 1 minus P2 hat over N2. That is the formula for this standard error. It's just a matter of plugging the numbers in, figuring out those sample proportions, plug the numbers in, calculate away. We will do that after the quiz. It is common for people to make mistakes when they use this because it's kind of a complicated formula. So the main thing is being careful to write down your intermediate work. I hope you don't make a mistake. But you get more partial credit if you write down your intermediate work. So it's a good idea to get to do. Oftentimes, the thing under the square root is pretty small. It comes out in scientific notation on calculators. So you got to be careful. We'll do that after the quiz.